Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Good morning, church. Good morning, church online. Can I just honor the people who woke up early this morning and decided they're going to visit church in this weather? Those who are visiting us for the first time, shout out to you guys. You're incredible. Um, so I don't know if you guys have heard of a movie uh, called The Man Who Sued God. Such an old movie. But I was thinking about it this morning when I woke up. So every time there is bad weather or what is considered dangerous weather, insurance companies will say to you, it's called an act of God, and they don't cover it, right? So what they're saying is, that's not our fault, it's God's fault, take it up with him. Because there's no way that we could have predicted these sort of circumstances, and your insurance against risk does not include what just happened. And so I was like, that's interesting. Everybody around the world agrees that bad weather is God's fault. Yet, if you go to Mauritius, or you find yourself at a lovely beach somewhere, nobody is saying, beach by God. <laughs> lovely weather, thank you God, right? So everything that goes wrong is easily God's fault. Whether you're Christian, not Christian, whether you believe in God or not, or your insurance company, if things go wrong, it's God's fault. But when things are going well, If I was God, and I created everything, like Genesis 1 tells us, I would have put my name on the sun. I'm not even joking. So that there is no dispute every time the sun rises and sets as to who created it. I would have written my name on the big sands, those numerous ones that he speaks about, so that when you take a step, you know every one of these grains of sands was created by God. If I was God and I created humans, I would have branded my name on their skin. Okay. Oh, please go to the next one. Yes. I would have branded my name on your skin. So that you don't walk around behaving as though you created yourself. So that you remember who the author of that body is. And that you don't blame that body only when it fails, but every time you breathe, you take breath, that you would remember that you were made and created by God. If I was God and I knew that everything was about my family, everything revolved around my son, I would have found a way to make sure that no one ever forgets. But God is not like me. And God is not like you. <laughs> God is not like us. He doesn't write his name on the sun. He created it. He created everyone. And he created everything and allows us to enjoy it, regardless of whether you honor him or thank him for it or not. It doesn't stop. He doesn't stop being God because we are unfaithful. He doesn't stop being good because we don't respond to his goodness. He doesn't stop creating goodness just because we choose not to see it. He doesn't write his name on the sun, although he created it. And the sun rises and the sun sets. And good things happen and good things don't. And the only time people say God's name is when things fail. God is not like us and that is good news. The best thing we can do for ourselves, our lives, our families, our cosmos, and our future is to know God. But not just to know God, to understand his purpose, our purpose, live for God and honor him. And in that and through that, we will flourish as human. The series that we've been on is called, Why Am I Here for Goodness Sake? And we've been looking at God as creator. We've been looking at God as author. We've been looking at God who created. And then we're looking at what the purpose of our lives is and everything in it. And as we go back to Genesis and we look back at the beginning, the God who was at the beginning, who created the beginning, who authored everything, and we look at the way that our lives look, for me, I'm always so interested and intrigued at how easy it is for life to continue and we ignore God. How many people are living without an acknowledgement of the existence of God? And it's easy to, to use that line and make it sound like that's a non-Christian life. But how many Christians are living as though God does not exist? 
So the series starts with Israel. Israel that has lived their whole life without God. Right? And now they are introduced to God. And although they've lived their entire life and their entire existence without God, now all of a sudden someone comes to say, let me tell you about your beginning. Let me tell you about the author of your story. Let me tell you about the purpose of your story. Let me tell you about you. Imagine, right? Find yourself, you're 40 or 50, and someone says, let me tell you about you. Someone who doesn't know you, someone says, let me tell you about your story, how it was created, how it was started, and what the purpose was. Can you imagine how confusing that would have been for them? Almost telling them that everything they know about life, how it exists, everything they know about how everything was ordered is not true. And so they're sitting there and they're listening in Genesis 1. Whatever they knew to be the, be to be the beginning is now told, no, in the beginning it was God. Yeah. They, they have to adjust to that reality that, hey, actually what you see to be day and night, there's actually somebody who intentionally did that. Then in Genesis 2, they be told that you, man, female, created together, power together. You guys are made in God's image. You're made to image God. You're made to bear his image. All of this for them was like, what do you mean? Because there was a life that they knew. There was an existence that they knew. And they were happy with it. And now all of a sudden enter God saying, hey, I am God. I didn't write my name on the sun, but now I'm introducing myself to you. Will you respond to my invitation, to my introduction? How will you respond to my invitation, to my introduction? Let's pray. Father God. As we enter prayer now, we pause to be still, to center ourselves and our scattered centers, senses upon the presence of God. Father, we choose in this moment not to be familiar. Father, we choose in this moment not to know, not to profess to know, but allow you, Father God, to introduce yourself as you are. Father, we choose this morning to set aside anything, Lord God, that we have believed to be true, that we have learned to be true, that is separate from who you say you are. And so, Father, right now we humble ourselves before you, and we ask you to come and introduce yourself, Lord God. Come like you can only come, Lord God. Father, we pray that anything that we have called God that is not you, Father, that that would be removed right now in Jesus' name. And that the Lord and Savior, Lord God, the author of the universe would be our God, the one that we serve, the one that we worship. And Father, that any other God, any other thing that is being worshipped above you, Lord God, would be dismissed this morning, Lord God, and you would receive full worship, full honor, and full praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in Genesis 3. Let's read it through and let's have a conversation about it this morning. So we're going to be in Genesis 3 from 1 to 14. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man said to his wife, the man and his wife hid himself from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said, to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. God bless the reading of your word. 
I'm not going to talk about women and sin. No. I'm not going to go down that tangent. I can hear you guys giggling. So we had the beginning, God created. We had the authorship of man, God created man in his image. Here we have enter a serpent. Now, we're not going to talk about the fact that the serpent is talking. Okay? You, we, we can't understand that through our eyes today. We have to understand what would this have meant to the people who were hearing it. Would it be strange for them to have heard and been told about a talking serpent? And the truth is no. Because a lot of the communication that was happening in that day was they used symbols by way of communicating. What do I mean by that? If I have a ring on my left finger, don't ask me where my ring is. If I have a ring on my left finger, without me saying anything, what would you presume? Right? So every culture has symbols that mean something that don't need explanation, right? So this would have been understood by that culture in a particular way. So don't be thrown off by the fact that the snake is talking, right? Thank you. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. If you want to talk about the detail of it, come afterwards. I'll tell you and break it down for you. But what I talk about is that there is a real enemy. But we have real authority. And those two things are both true. Now, I really struggle with this tension. Before I got discipled and had people walking with me, I was very enemy conscious. Very conscious of the threat of the enemy, very conscious of hell, very conscious of darkness and evil and the potential of threat that lurked behind every time I stepped out the door. Then I got discipled and I was like, the enemy has been defeated. And then I completely ignored him. Both of those things are wrong, right? Yeah. Because there is a real enemy, but we have real authority. Those things are both true. And we don't want to find ourselves between any one of those extremes. You don't ignore the enemy and pretend that he doesn't exist. Otherwise, you'll find yourself tripping unnecessarily. But at the same time, you don't submit or make your whole entire existence revolve around the existence of, of someone who does not have any authority. Now, just because they don't have authority does not mean they cannot act in a particular way towards you. And so what's happening here is that the enemy approaches Eve. The enemy approaches Eve in conversation. And what you see is people wonder, why did God not enter the story? Where was God? Why wasn't he close by to whisper to Eve and say, Eve, don't do this, right? But this is the same good God that did not write his name on the sun. The same God that gives us an option to choose him. This is the same God that goes, I am not going to bully you into loving me. I want you to love me and I want to invite you into a loving relationship with me. So this creature, remember in Genesis 2, was never meant to rule humanity. Humanity was meant to rule over everything, including this creature and what it represents. That's the authority. Humanity is meant to rule over the enemy. So here he comes questioning God's word, God's love, and God's wisdom. The enemy is basically accusing God of lying. And he's also accusing God of not having good intentions towards Eve and Adam. God has a will and purpose for our lives. We have a will and purpose for our lives. The enemy has a will and purpose for our lives. All of those three things are true. How the enemy works is to present options to us through ideas, thoughts, plant seeds of desire. Now what you need to see is not like Eve successfully disputed the enemy, right? She was like, no, no, no. He said we can eat everything. And then he said, but he doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to know. And then she desired to know. Before that, she had no desire to know. Until he said, he doesn't want you to know. Now all of a sudden, she desires to know. But here's, here's the lie in this. God knew of evil. But God did not experience evil. So he was lying. God did not rob them of an experience that he had. God did not experience evil. God cannot have evil inside of him. God knew of evil the way that a doctor knows about cancer. Can study cancer, can be an expert at removing cancer, but God has never had cancer. God has never had any evil in him. And so God's prohibition to them was the same prohibition he had towards himself. God did not interact with anything evil. He was only good. And he said to his people, you are good. You be like me. So the, prohib the prohibition, do not eat, was not anything that he wasn't applying himself. 
God was not participating in evil and he said, you don't participate in evil. So God's prohibition was not denying us of anything that he wasn't denying himself. If God is good and he said everything good is yours, there's nothing that he was participating in that he wasn't extending to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's go to Matthew 4. So you don't have to go there, but I just wanted to highlight that Jesus had the same conversation with the enemy. And so if sometimes we're judging Eve and going, why was Eve entertaining the enemy? Jesus, why was Jesus entertaining the enemy? Why was Jesus entertaining the enemy? Jesus was man, like us. But Jesus conquered in a way that Eve didn't, which means we can too. So what happened? The enemy came to Jesus and started whispering words that would make him want to desire what God had said is prohibited. Which would make him want to access things that God has said, this is denied. But he wanted to create in Jesus a desire. And the truth is, the enemy would not have been engaging with Jesus if it was not possible for Jesus to be tempted by these things. You understand that? So Jesus was fully tempted by the things that the enemy was saying, and the enemy knew exactly how to tempt Jesus, and he did. But Jesus responds, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. Then the devil left. What did Jesus say? Be gone. Be gone. And so this is why Paul says we have to take every thought captive. Because in that space of thought is the only space where the enemy can start establishing an authority. Literally the only space. What are you thinking? How is that leading to what you're believing? And it's so powerful that that's where the authority comes from. He has absolutely no authority unless we partner with him in some way. Absolutely no authority, unless we partner with him in some way. But how easy is it for that thought that started off small to become a monster? When you don't say, be gone. When you don't discipline yourself to say, be gone. But that discipline cannot come if you don't understand what the word says. If you're not reading the word, if we're not intimate with the words that God is speaking over us, there is no possible way that we'll be able to identify that that thought is not God. That that thought needs a be gone. And a lot of them are very close to our desires. Ne? Very close to the things we actually desire. But those things we actually desire are also the things that God desires for us. But God is asking that you do not take what he already has for you illegitimately. Don't steal what's already yours. Allow me to decide how I give it to you, when it's right for you, when it will be good for you. Don't steal what's already yours. Because the enemy is trying to make you steal that which is yours. Don't steal what's yours. Trust the Lord. Amen. So the enemy says to her, you will know and it's going to be good. But does knowing help... Do you know that we in this generation know more than any other generation has ever known? But we are the most anxious, the most stressed generation, the, most, the generation that is not sleeping because of the amount of knowledge that we have. Does knowing help? Does knowing help us trust God? How many of us, God, if you told me everything, I would obey you faithfully. Isn't this what we say? But do you know the more we know, even theologically, I'm studying theology. Studying theology makes it difficult to follow God. I sit and I think about the word. I'm like, yo, but then this one, it's hard. It's making it harder, not easier to follow God. Knowing is not as helpful as we think it is. We believe that the more we know, the easier it will be to trust, really. You know what we want? We want control. Not knowledge, necessarily. We want the knowledge that gives us control. During COVID, I was glued to the news. Like, I mean, we're still during COVID. During the height of COVID, I was glued to the news. Every night, how many people died? Every night, what's happening at the hospitals? Every, and then in the morning, I, like I'm waking up, I'm, I'm coughing. I'm like, I have it. That is what the knowledge does. That, don't you go through that? Maybe your friend calls you and tells you, I think I was exposed. Now you're like, I have COVID. Like you can, you, and the symptoms actually start to follow your body because someone said something. You, you read something on the news and now you're dying. Have you ever Googled symptoms? Google 
Google tells you you died yesterday. <laughs> knowledge does knowledge help. And so people think God denied them the knowledge of good and evil and this was a bad thing. God was denying them knowledge that was going to harm them. You want to know? Why do you want to know? Why do you think God is withholding good things for you? What do you want to know so that you can what? Not sleep? God knows something that we don't know. And if he tells us, it will be better. This is what we believe. That's the enemy's lie. If God tells us everything, it will be better. So in Genesis 3, 4 to 5, the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. But you know what happened after they ate of it? They did know. But what they knew is how inadequate they were. And it dawned on them that this relationship that they have with God doesn't make sense. They should not be in it. They are not worthy of it. And all of a sudden it dawned on them that they are naked and they're bare. And God, how is this existing? And then God says, who told you that you were naked? Because now they're starting to hide away from God when they had proximity to the Lord. They had access to God and they did not know that this access was costly. They did not know that this access is actually supposed to be illegal. You know, they didn't know all of these things and it allowed them to be free in God's presence. It allowed them to be human with God and not know that this thing is actually an impossible thing that's happening here. And then it dawned on them in one instance after they took what God told them not to took and all of a sudden they knew that it's actually dangerous to be with God. It's actually dangerous to be in the presence of God. And so when they started to hide, God came as he usually does and he says, who told you that you were naked? Who gave you this knowledge that is now separating you from me? Who gave you this information that is causing you to hide? The more details we want about God's commandments in order to obey, the less we trust. Obey God without the details. It's better for us, not for God, for us. The more details we want, the more difficult it is to obey. This is not my opinion. This is scripture. Even Jeremiah, God calls him, God tells him exactly what he needs him to do. Jeremiah is like, absolutely not. Moses, Moses, this is exactly what I need you to do. This is how it's going to work. Moses says, absolutely not. Every single person who received details, the details did not make them courageous. The details did not lead to better obedience. But the people that acted in faith, there was fruit because the knowledge was not important. It was the person who gave the instruction. Life was in the voice, not the instruction. Are you guys still good? Okay. The last thing I want to speak about is this. The God of the garden is chiefly remembered as the one who prohibits. Right? So in the scripture, I hope it's the next one. Yes. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man to say, what was the first commandment? You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. That was the first commandment. Yeah. That was the first commandment that he gave them. But when we ask, or when we are asked, what is the first commandment that God gave Adam and Eve? What do we say? But, we start here, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. That's how we know God. Not as you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. And even when we tell the story, what did God say to Adam and Eve? Don't eat from that one tree. That one tree. Don't eat from that one tree. Not eat from the whole garden. Everything is yours. You can name all the animals. You can subdue the earth. No, no, no. That's not what we know God for. What, what did God do? He told them not to eat the tree, the fruit, that one fruit. Because we know God to be a God of prohibition, right? Because we know God to be a God of rules, of what not to do. God is trying to make our lives miserable. And his laws are there to make us grumpy. But God said, in another translation, it says, you are free to eat of anything. You are free to eat of anything. 
Is that the God we serve? No. The God we serve is the one of Leviticus with the 600 laws. When we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about Leviticus and those 600 laws of the things that we're not supposed to do. Regardless of the fact that 400 of those 200 laws are not even applicable today, but that's how we know God. That's how we choose to associate with God. With the things that he says we should not do that are good for us, we moan and groan about those instead of going, God said, I am free. And this is the posture with, when he, with which he has defined freedom to exist in. You know what boundaries are? Boundaries are a safety net. And in, in that safety net, he says, in here you can do anything. In here you can do anything and that will cause you no harm. But if you do it outside of this boundary, you're going to get harmed. And we groan about this boundary as if God is not good. The deceit of the enemy takes that which God has called evil and leads us to believe that evil is good for us. Eve began to see the tree that was evil as good. How many things are we looking at with envy? Things that are bad for us that we believe could be good. Things that the world is telling us are good, but we're looking at it with this desire like, God, why can't I have this? God, why can't my life go in this direction? Why can't it look like this? And I'm serving you faithfully. Why is this not happening like this? The truth is we are actually lovers more than we are thinkers. Because as Eve answered this question, her answer was actually perfect. She knew the truth in her mind. But the, the something happened in her heart that made her desire the wrong thing. So no matter how much we have the right in our, in our minds and we wrestle with it in our minds, the truth is that we desire certain things in our hearts. And so the answer really is that we need to love God. Not just know about God, but we need to love God with our whole hearts. That is the only way that we will overcome evil. We need to love God, not try harder, not follow rules better. Love God. And you can't love God. Okay, let me actually not even tell you about love. Loving a person, a loving relationship requires certain things. Requires effort, requires communication, honesty, vulnerability. You cannot love God in a religious way. You need to love God with your heart. With the everything in you, the good, the bad. Not bringing only certain parts of you to the relationship with the Lord that you think will be pleasing towards Him. We can't hide. You bring it all, not only to God, but to the family of God. And you bring your whole self as you are in loving relationship with the people that he's called you to. God has called us to love. More than to just think about the word, more than to just talk about the word, God has called us to love. To love him and to love others. Now, when I first uh, fell in love with God, started reading the word, started repenting of sin, I really loved God. Like, I loved God so much that I, I just decided I'm not going to get married anymore. Like, I'm not going to get married. And I was so serious. Like, because I really just loved God and there was nothing in my mind that could compare to the love that I had for the Lord. And so I spent most of my 20s just really just sh rejecting every single guy that came my way because I was like, there is nothing that can compare to what I'm feeling right now towards God. And I was running fiercely towards the Lord. And then a guy came. <laughs> and I was shocked, ne? because I had spent maybe eight years like pursuing God, madly in love with God. I was so shocked that in three months, someone seems to have overtaken my love for God. And I was actually like alarmed because I'm like, how can it be so easy for something to overtake what I've built with God over eight years? I mean, not that falling in love was a bad thing, but I was shocked that how can it be so easy for another love to overtake my love for God? And I realized I'm like, this love for God has to keep growing for it to be number one, it can't just stay stationary. For it to be able to overtake other desires, for it to overwhelm everything, it has to keep growing. And so now this person that I'd fallen in love with, I had to find a way to accelerate my love for God so that it overtakes this love. Because this love, as good as it is, cannot overarch my love for God. It was tough. The scripture in Colossians, I'm sorry, I don't have it. It says, he's the image of the invisible God 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him everything might be preeminent. That word preeminent, um, Pastor Steve Mao once described it like this. He's like, God not only is number one, but there's no close second. Like number two so far back, you can't even see. So for me, having God as number one is not the challenge. The problem is number two and three and four and five. They're like literally right here. So sometimes you're not sure, like, is God still one? Is the because they're so close, right? So yesterday I could have gone to bed and God was number one, but today something else is ruling my affections. Because they're so close, the other desires are like chasing my love for God. And so I can't say that every day Christ is number one for me. I love God, I do. But there are other loves that easily overtake my love for God. And so my, my heart every day is like, God, let's move our relationship, man, so that... <laughs> So that it's way ahead of any other thing. I don't want to keep wondering that, oh, my career, oh, ministry, oh, my marriage, oh, all these things, are they close to overtaking my love for God? Because just because these things are good doesn't mean that they are God and they're worthy of worship, right? So I need to be checking, hey, is my worship and love for God preeminent? Is it first with no close second? Because that's how we overcome evil. That's how we overcome evil, by loving God. And not just loving God, first with no close second. Do you know that God placed the tree in the center where he was? So that every time they would have to choose between the tree and him, he would be right there. Right? So God is not running away from the things that cause us temptation. He's right there. There's always a God that you can call to for help. Because God doesn't wait for us in the corner while we sin and go, just tell me when you're done. <laughs> no, he's everywhere with us so that we have an option for refuge each time. That we have an option for belief instead of unbelief each time. He is always there, omniscient, omnipresent, so that you can have a close friend to call on in your time of need. God is not far away. God doesn't hide, we hide. God doesn't hide. He came to them in the garden, although they had sinned. He came. He's like, hey, where are you? Who told you that you're naked? What is this now? Come. Come. Approach with confidence. May God be first with no close second. May we overcome evil with love. Our love for God, our love for the community of God overcomes every evil thing. And so all we need to do is this one thing, love God. Respond to the love that he has given us wholeheartedly and passionately. Love him back. That is the only thing we need to do. And that is the relationship that Jesus died for. That is what he died for. He died for that gap that was created in Genesis 3. That gap that we knew of for us not to be aware of it anymore. For that gap not to have an influence any longer between our relationship with Jesus. There is now no longer a reason for there to be a gap between you and God. If there is a gap, it's because we are hiding. Not because God is hiding. Can we pray this morning? Father God, this morning we choose to draw near. Father God, we choose to draw near, Lord God. For every part of our hearts, Lord God, that has distanced itself, Lord God, from you. Father, for any part of our heart that feels like this is irrelevant to you, Father. For even the things, Lord God, that we really desire, Lord God, that we really desire and need, Father God. That might be number two that is slowly becoming number one. Father, we just, we just come, Lord God, into your presence and, Father, we pray for our, la our hearts to catch a light again, Lord God, for our love for you to be renewed and revived. Father, and I pray, Lord God, for even a person who's never experienced the radical love of God, that this morning right now, Lord God, that your love would be tangible. Father, for even a person, Lord God, this morning who has never imagined themselves that they can be in a relationship with you, an intimate relationship with you, Father, we just release that invitation this morning, Lord God that you would be known and knowable, Lord God, to every person in this room. 
Father, I pray for every prayer item, every desire, every longing. Father, and we bring it here, Lord God, to your altar. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that no longing would be fulfilled in an illegitimate way. Father, so we speak for every longing that's here, whether it's the longing for a degree, the longing for a spouse, the longing for a promotion, the longing for a job, the longing for things to improve, the desire for things to be better, just the desire to take the next step and for things not to feel like we've been stuck for a long time. Father, we bring all those longings, all those desires, all those frustrations, Lord God, and we bring them before you. And God, I just rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name over these longings, Lord God. That there would be no accusations and whispers over these longings that make people feel, Lord God, like this is the God. This is what we worship. We don't worship these longings, Lord God. But we bring them before you, Lord God, because they're legitimate and you, you care about these longings. You care about our desires. And Father, I just speak, Lord God, Heavenly Father, come. Come, Lord God. Come, Lord God. Father, I just release your proximity in this place. Father, that people would be able to know and feel you near, Lord God. You're not far away. So, Father, I pray for a near presence, Lord God, in this room, in Jesus' name. Fill this room, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your proximity, for your closeness, for your nearness. Thank you, Father. You know, as, as Musa was speaking, I felt like there were, there were some people here that God wanted to minister to. You know, the thing about sin is that it devastates us. God didn't want us there because it was going to harm us, as Musa said. And I, f I feel like there's some people that, that, that you're living with a broken heart. You're living with some pain in your soul. That, that the brokenness of the world around you has, has stolen something from you. It's stolen a part of your identity. It's stolen a part of your well-being. And I feel like God wants to minister to you. Specifically, specifically, there are some people that are just reeling. Or that might be a strong word because it might not be that strong. But you, you, you're feeling... You're feeling the, the pain of broken relationships. And I feel like God wants to minister to you. So if, if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor. Won't you stand up? If that's you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Specifically, I, I also felt that there are people here that, that you have in some way, that there's some sickness or disease that it's either in your family line or it's in you specifically. And ultimately, sickness and disease is a result of the broken relationship that mankind has experienced with God in Genesis 3. So if that's you, I'm going to ask you also to stand up. If you have some kind of disease in your body right now, or there's been some kind of genetic disease that has happened in your family, won't you stand up? I feel like God wants to heal you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Sound team, I would love us to have some music. Are we battling to get the music going? Okay. Okay, just, just hum quietly to yourself. <laughs> I'm only joking. Jesus can come without, with or without music. There we go. Lord Jesus, I, I want to ask for everyone standing. First of all, I ask for those who are battling with broken relationships right now in Jesus' name, Father God, that place in their soul that has been stolen from. Right now in Jesus' name, I ask for a restoration. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, I feel like there is something that needs to be returned to them. And Lord God, I'm asking, Lord God, that they would receive that, that sense of identity, that sense of wholeness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And those, of, those that are standing right now that have sickness and disease in their body, right now I break the hold of that. Lord God, we just declare that Jesus Christ became a curse for us, that we would not have to suffer under the curse of the law. Right now we declare those bodies healed in Jesus' name. Right now we declare that sickness gone. Right now we de declare those bodies whole in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My friends, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to sit down. 
Um, if you had any pain in your body at the moment, won't you just check it out? And if there's any difference, you can just let us know. Those of you who are battling with, with relational brokenness, where there'd been a broken relationship, I'm going to ask you to speak to your Connect Group leader and ask for some personal prayer in that regard. Because this kind of pain gets, gets healed over time in community. And I'm going to ask you to be real and honest with someone about that. And last of all, can we all stand? Part of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is where we've held that fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, we give it back to Him. We turn away from being in charge of our own lives. We turn away from, from making decisions without consulting the love of God, without being in His presence. And so I'm going to ask you that if, if you are here and you know you're far from Jesus, you know that you have been living your life under the direction of your own authority. I want to ask you to, to pray this prayer with me in order to return to Him. So can we all pray together? Lord Jesus, I come to You. Lord, I turn from the, from the places where I've been deceived by that voice. Where my, where my desires have overtaken my desire for you. And Lord God, I turn back to you and I ask that you would fill me again. Lord Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. I love you and I acknowledge you. I acknowledge you as Lord of all. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. If you if you uh, made that prayed that prayer and you meant that you wanted to make a change in your life, you wanted a new commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ or a first one, I'm going to ask you on those. I'm going to ask you this. If you wouldn't mind going to our info table and there you will find a next steps form. I'm going to ask you if you could just mark on that form that you you would like to make a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will follow up with you and we'll help you with your next steps. So God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a glorious week.